What's going on guys, Jason Frosto for TennisUnleashed.net and welcome to part two of our 2023 Men's Australian Open Finals match analysis between Djokovic and Tsitsipas. To find out exactly how Djokovic beat Tsitsipas in this match, stay tuned because it's coming up next. Okay, so we're gonna focus on something I like to call damage to start off part two. Damage is a category that I actually came up with back in 2014 and started tracking it in all matches, doing research on tennis as well. So we've got this damage category and basically damage is any time that you get your opponent on their back foot, get them on the dead run, or force them into a position where they have to hit a weak ball back to you because of the aggressiveness or positioning of your previous shot. So what did damage look like in this match? Total damage for this match, right? We had Novak doing damage to Steph 94 times and Tsitsipas doing damage to Novak 75 times. So we can see plus 19 to Novak in the total damage category. And of those damaging shots, Djokovic did counter damage 21 times to Tsitsipas compared to Tsitsipas's 15 times. And what is counter damage, right? Counter damage is any time that your opponent damages you and you actually do damage from a defensive position to them back. And that is much more rare, right, than doing damage. So again, 21-15 Djokovic on counter damage and Djokovic actually had less opportunities to do counter damage. So let's look at some points now and let's look at Djokovic's ability to defend and do damage and counter damage. All right, so before we get into the actual analysis, I wanna play this once in real time, and then we'll start breaking it down frame by frame. So here we go. Good return by Steph on the reach. Djokovic saves that. Steph with the big thumper forehand. Djokovic does a little counter damage right there, and then finishes with the winner. So here, right, we've got Djokovic serving. He hits a really nice serve right here, guys, down the tee. This is a first serve situation. We've got Tsitsipas here in zone four, getting ready to try to return this thing. And we see Steph here really stretching and really reaching. And we talked about this. We know a person is in trouble on a shot anytime you see their head and their head is not directly over their hips. Here, Steph's head is over his outside foot, right? So he's really stretched on this shot. He's in a really tough position and we know he's really off balance. So Djokovic should be expecting typically in this position, a weaker return, but Steph, right, does a really good job in this position of actually hitting a damaging return and getting Djokovic on his back foot. And remember, damage is any time you get your opponent in a defensive situation, get them stretched, reaching, you really do significant damage to them where you're expecting then for them to hit a weak ball on this side of the court, but let's see what Djokovic does with this stretch backhand. And he does decent with it, but it's hanging up in the middle of the court, right? He might have just barely got zone three depth, but the ball is sitting up and we can really see Steph on this side is really loading his body and getting ready to be aggressive. The more time a player has on this side of the court or this side, the more time they have, the more aggressive they can get and really load with their legs and their body. So let's see what Steph does smacks the forehand. That's a huge forehand. That was a rifle shot forehand, boom. And he's got Novak running from one side of the court to the other side of the court in a very defensive position. Okay, so just go back for a second. Novak has to book it to the other side of the court. And Novak here is just sort of scrambling and doing a great job. This is something people can learn from at home, especially in junior development. When you're on the run and the ball is very aggressive and it's not a really high ball, Anchor your hips down like this and really get your hips down so that you can lower your center of gravity and try to control your shot depth and power, but really your shot depth and your shot aim, okay? So Djokovic really does a great job getting the hips and the legs down when he's in these tough defensive positions and it allows him to counter really well. And there it is, there's the counter damage, right? What does he come up with off of Steph's rifle shot? He comes up with a deep ball here in zone three, and now he's got Steph anchoring his hips down, trying to defend against the counter damage from Djokovic. And look at that defense, right? And I'm not picking on Steph, he'd kill me any day on a tennis court, but he rolls it with topspin, and this ball is now sitting short in zone two for Djokovic. So Djokovic takes defense, right, right here, boom, hits counter damage right here, forces Steph 
to roll this ball up, right? And when he rolls up, he doesn't get the depth. It's that short in zone two. And we know Djokovic is lethal on the backhand side, right? This is what I talked about in part one. A great forehand is standard on tour these days. Everybody has a great forehand. Have a great backhand to go along with that great forehand so that when it comes time to finish, you're not just a forehand finisher, but you can finish with your backhand as well because your backhand is a big damaging shot. Inside out backhand, small target, and there's the finish. Let's look at that again. Djokovic really loading. And the big thing I think he took from Serena Williams, and you know whether you're a fan of Serena Williams or not, doesn't matter to me at this point, Djokovic is really leaning on his aggressive backhands, kind of leaning forward and into them. And that's something that Serena has actually talked about how she gets power on her backhand. She talked about kind of sinking in and leaning forward and leaning on the ball to get the aggression. In my opinion, Djokovic has adopted the same mentality of leaning into the backhands to get more out of them and just rifling him. And there's the small target for the finish, right? Let's move on to the next point now, guys. All right, so let's let this play once in real time before we break it down, guys. Novak serving. Steph, really nice zone three depth return. Djokovic off the back foot. Little chip here, inside out from Steph to do a little bit of damage right there. And then misses that inside out forehand at the end. Let's break it down frame by frame. So again, we got Djokovic serving near side, Steph on the far side returning. Second serve, we see the very obvious kick serve motion and path of the racket from Novak here, giving away the kick. Also the body position being very sideways. We talked about that in part one. Kick right to the backhand, a little bit short, not gonna do much. Steph though, nice job stepping up on this and taking it early this time from zone three. He didn't take a lot of second serve returns from zone three and we talked about that in part one, but he did take this one from zone three just inside the baseline. Tremendous depth here in zone three to do damage to Novak and get Novak on the back foot with a late contact point. So when a player has a late contact point, unless you're Steffi Graf for the throwback people out there, when the contact point is pushed into your body and it's a late contact point, it's very unlikely that you're gonna get aggressive on your next shot. But let's see what Novak comes up with on this one. And he does a pretty good job. And that's what I'm talking about. Players getting aggressive from these really tough positions. And Novak does that. He goes down the line into zone three. And with that depth and moving Steph from one side of the court to the other, he's gonna have a chance to do some damage on this shot. Let's see what happens. And there it is, right? That's the difference between Steph and Novak. As soon as Novak does damage, Steph is more likely to hit short here and he does in zone one and give Novak the opportunity to potentially attack him. Now we can see Novak's not gonna attack on this one, right? He's preparing a slice backhand. How do we know it's a slice? We see an open racket face and we see two hands on the racket, but the top hand is on the throat of the racket. So we know the slice is coming from Novak. And Novak decides to hit a little chip here, hits it here, finds that zone three depth, and that gives Steph, right, the chance to really step around that. Novak's hitting the slice, so now Steph comes from all the way here and decides, I got time, man, to come around and crank a forehand. And he does that and finds zone three depth and puts Djokovic on defense. And there's some really good depth, though, right, from Novak to counter that. Again, just kind of counter neutralize. Doesn't do damage to Steph on this particular ball, in my opinion, but he neutralizes with the depth and counters that way and forces Steph into a bad decision, right? Steph's frustrated. Look at the depth from Novak in this point. He's frustrated and he just overshoots from a bad position and then misses the shot. And let's just look at the total number of counters in this match, right? We talked about counter damage, but what about total counters, right? Djokovic had 32 total counters in this match versus Tsitsipas's 22. So he beat him in counter damage, he beat him in total counters with less opportunities to do so. It really speaks to how good of an attacker Novak is now, but also the incredible defender that we also know he is. Another category I came up with in 2014 when I started tracking all this stuff and doing match analysis breakdowns and articles, was something I like to call big and small targets. So if we look on the screen right now, we see the red shaded area. Anything that lands in there is gonna be considered to be a small target that lands in the red sideline areas. 
all the green dots that are landing between those red areas, those are all going to be considered to be big targets. Small targets are two or less feet from the single sideline, and big targets are two or more feet inside the single sideline. So what were the percentage of big and small targets in this match, right? Because especially developing players, a lot of players want to hit small targets all the time, and that's how they think matches are won and lost at the highest level, and that is not true. In this match, Djokovic hit 91% of his shots after the serve as big targets. 9% of his shots were small targets. If we look at those numbers for Tsitsipas, he hit 90% of his shots as big targets and just 10% as small targets. So Tsitsipas actually took a little bit more risk in this match, left to right aim, than Djokovic did. Djokovic played with more conservative targets and still won the match, did more damage, right, and was more effective off the ground while using bigger targets overall than Tsitsipas. Okay, so let's jump into the third point now. We're gonna start looking at targets, right? Let's let it play once in real time before we do the analysis frame by frame. Second serve by Steph. Nice backhand from Novak. Novak attacks with the inside in there. Steph with a nice backhand here, just a little short. Novak gets a little aggressive on this. And then Steph ends up with the shank on the inside in. Let's break it down now and see the use of those big targets and how this point was won. All right, so again, we've got Steph here near side serving, second serve, right, on the ad side, and then Djokovic returning, starting in zone four. Obvious kick, right? Guys will kind of let this really arc and fall on their kick serve, right? And we see the sideways position here with Steph's body as well, letting us know a kick's coming, and there it is. A little bit short in the box. Novak here, right, stepping up inside and taking this in zone three, wants to get aggressive position and take time away without having to crank the ball in the return. He does that, and he gets it away from Sitsipas's forehand, immediately isolates the backhand right away. It's a zone two ball, it's not deep, but it's getting away from the forehand. Steph hits a pretty mediocre, no offense, Steph, a backhand landing short in zone two in the middle, which allows Novak to line up and wind up for the forehand, right? Cranks the forehand down the line in zone three, and again, takes Steph from one side of the court to the other, and initiates him into a defensive position. So Novak, chance to do damage with this, and he does. Look where Steph hits off that inside in forehand. Boom here, and then it's short, landing in zone one. This is where Sitsipas needs to get better. When he's in defensive positions, he needs to get better at getting better depth consistently against the aggressor right here. Djokovic again, down the line, zone two, isolating that backhand from Steph. Sitsipas again, short and weak and fluffy in zone two. So if Djokovic wants to get aggressive here, he's got time to load his body on this backhand. Takes it again, and Steph does a better job with this one, right? Receiving that backhand from the wide position. He gets zone three depth this time on this shot right here, right? And almost stretches it to the small target. Now, I will say one thing about this as well, though. When you're kind of hitting this really loopy, spinny backhand, and it's landing close to a small target, if you're not doing damage to Djokovic with this shot from Tsitsipas, Tsitsipas has a very large recovery area that he has to cover on Djokovic's next shot. So a shot like this could put Steph in danger of getting damage to a small target down the line from Djokovic, or even a small target back in this direction. Let's see what happens, though, guys. And Djokovic just plays the zone three ball deep here, right? And Tsitsipas, again, not really doing damage with his backhand and not aiming it well, feels like he can step around this forehand. He steps around the wrong forehand and then shanks it down the line. And why was it the wrong forehand, right? It's simply the wrong forehand because it had zone three depth and it also had some pace to it from Djokovic here. So stepping around, getting a little bit of a late contact point here, not having the body down, his hips aren't down enough to get aggressive with this ends up a shank, and then the point is over. All right, let's move on to the final point, guys. All right, so we'll let it play once in real time, then we'll break it down. So here's the real time, right? Steph serving, Djokovic ad side return, heavy roller, Steph a little bit of the shank backhand again there, right? A little bit of poor spacing on that one-hander. Nice angle there into a small target, and then misses small target down the line. So let's just go back here and let's break this thing down now, guys, in real time. Steph serving, right? 
and the serve was almost a little bit more of a body serve attempt to try to keep Djokovic from guessing on his returns. We've talked about a lot of times when Djokovic is returning serve, instead of splitting and then making a forehand or backhand just in a straight line here, he'll tend to split and then he'll guess left or right with his movement as to where the serve is going. He tends to cheat, but Steph, little body serve right there, right? Jams Novak a little bit. Novak goes short on the return into zone two. Steph not really able to do a lot of damage with his backhand or aim it very well, so he's looking for a lot of forehands on his first shot and the point off his own serve. He takes one there into zone two and moves Djokovic from one side of the court to the other, but this is lacking some depth. He's not gonna do damage to Djokovic just with that shorter ball. And Novak, high roller. Novak had time because there was no depth. High, heavy roller way over the net, right to Steph's backhand, right? And that is meant to try to do damage to Steph by making Steph take the ball early on the rise before it reaches its peak to see if he can get Steph to hit the ball short. And Steph comes up with a pretty good shot. So a small target, more of a zone two ball here, but it is fluffy and it is just kind of sitting up. That gives Novak chance to wind up on the backhand. And he does, takes it zone two, keeps the ball again away from Stefanos's forehand on this side, is able to aim it really well and keep it away from that side really well. Steph floats one here, this time zone two, right? Right to Djokovic's backhand. And Novak's just gonna pepper that backhand zone three this time. He's gonna sit there with Sitsipas because he knows Sitsipas cannot beat him in these backhand exchanges back and forth. Zone two ball, right? And this one ends up small target again. And actually I'd say it's a zone three ball this time, but small target, he's really stretching it wide, but he's gotta be careful when he's stretching Novak wide because he's giving him more angle to work with on the next shot. He better be ready to defend. And Djokovic, again, I'm just gonna sit here, man, with you all day, zone three, zone three, zone three for the most part. And I'm gonna make you do something with that backhand. Steph, just a hair late on that one, I think. Right, he's come to contact, a little bit jammed here, a little tiny bit late, even though he's going down the line, you wanna be a little later on that contact, and then misses small target, because he knows, Steph knows, he's not gonna beat Djokovic in this cross-to-cross -cross battle. Tsitsipas has hit two small target backhands, which is pretty tough to do in a point, and still can't win the point. Djokovic keeps peppering over here over and over and over again. Sitsipas really needs to work on his ability to take his backhand and get it to the outside of the court here consistently away from someone's forehand and with depth. He's not there yet. A lot of his shots with the backhand are very inconsistent left to right. And let's just bring up a stat for that real quick, guys. So we we're just talking about the aim for both players. And if we look at the aim in this match, Sitsipas hit 40% of his shots in this match to the middle third of the court. Cross court, 31% and down the line, 29%. For Djokovic, those stats were a little bit different. Only 31% of his shots went to the middle third of the court, 39% went cross court, and 30% went down the line. So again, Tsitsipas, way too many balls to the middle third of the court compared to Djokovic, and that gave Djokovic a lot of opportunity to crank forehand. All right, guys, that wraps it up for part two of our 2023 Australian Open men's finals match analysis between Novak Djokovic and Stefano Tsitsipas. If you found this video helpful or you feel like you learned something today, make sure you smash that like and subscribe button. It helps this channel continue to grow. I'm Jason Frosto for TennisUnleashed.net. I'll see you next time.